This morning we're going to begin a new series that we'll be going over over the next few weeks. It's entitled, God is More Than Enough. This series is going to be at times loosely based on the book by the same name, written by Jim Berg. So maybe you're familiar with Jim Berg. If you are familiar with him, he wrote Changed Into His Image, Created for His Glory, and some other books like that. And so we're going to kind of, we'll, we'll loosely base on that as we go through this. The subtitle of the book is Foundations for a Quiet Soul. And we'll make the case for why this is necessary in just a moment. This, this study, uh, the, the book, if you were to get it, and I would encourage you, if you'd like, it's available online, it's available in, in print or in digital format, and it is a good book. It's not a workbook, kind of, so it's not like Living the Exchange that we went through, so um, that's why I didn't take the time to, to order the books necessarily, because we're just going to, we're not going to be reading it necessarily. But if you would be interested in getting a copy, uh, if you'll let me know, I can help with that. Or like I said, it's available on Amazon or any number of book places. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 tells us, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The word perilous, the Greek word means fierce or dangerous, troublesome or hard to bear. And that pretty well describes the days in which we live, doesn't it? For, for whatever reason, and we'll, we'll discuss that. Trouble isn't hard to find. Perilous times are not difficult to find if we look around for them, or truth be told, if we're not looking for them, they're easy to find. They, they seem to come up. If you, if you watch the news and you look at our world, you see the economy, particularly in America, you see the economy. You see the education system and what's going on with the education system. We have the war in Russia and Ukraine and the possibility of escalation, right? That everybody has to thought, well, well, what if, what if a missile hits Poland and it drags NATO? What, what if? There's all of these what, what ifs that come up. There's racial tension. There's social tension. There's all that. And that's just, that's just out there. Then you, you come into the home, and, and did you know that divorce rates are falling in the United States? Good. They are. The reason that they're falling, though, is because couples have decided rather than get married, they'll just live together. So cohabitation has become the norm in many, many cases. Rather than get married, people just live together, and so when they, when they separate, it's not technically a divorce. So the, those numbers are going down, but not for the right reasons. Moral decline seems to be at an epic surge right now. The, uh, the, the availability of pornography and sensuality and the, the ease of access to any form of entertainment that you can imagine. Literally, your imagination is the limit of what you can find. If you go online and you, you're of a mind, you can find anything, and people do. And it's... it's it's dragging the culture down. It's leading to these perilous times. There's ineptitude in government. There's apathy in religion. There's disjointedness in the home. And there's unrest in private thought. That describes the day in which we live. We see that everywhere. And as a society, we've looked in all the wrong places to solve these issues. Have you noticed that? Uh, I think it was Ronald Reagan said that the, the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And uh, <laughs> it's true, isn't it? When we're looking at all the wrong places. The government is not going to fix the moral problem in America. And it doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who your senator is. They're not going to fix. Now, now it does matter who's in a position of authority because it extends the liberties that we have. I pray that, that we will have government in position who will leave us alone as a church so that we can do what we are commanded to do, so that we can evangelize, so that we can meet together and worship the Lord together. But regardless of who's in the White House, who's holding our Senate and House seats, it's not going to fix the problems that we have. Our problems are deeper than that. All of these things that we've talked about constantly bombard us. 
when we have the TV on or the radio on or we have out our phone and we're, we're scrolling through social media or news sites or whatever it is. And here's the thing. It's also echoing when we turn everything off. Yeah. When you turn off the news, you still think of it. All of these things, it's not that it's just noise that comes at you. And by the way, I'm not preaching that you should be uninformed. You should be informed. There's nothing wrong innately with watching the news and knowing what's going on. That's not, a, that's not wrong, but we're talking about how it, it can oppress, how it can become uh, a, a thing that, that just it echoes in your mind. When you turn the TV on, you hear it louder. When you turn the TV off, you hear it softer, but you always hear it. We're a culture of noisy souls. A noisy soul, in the interest of the book that we're looking at, is not just something that lost people deal with, by the way. It's something that uh, if we're not consciously dealing with it on a regular basis, we as believers will, will struggle with this as well. Having, having that, that unrest that uneasiness, that feeling. You ever, you ever have a day where you say, I just feel real off today. And sometimes those days can stretch into uh, a couple days and then sometimes a week. And then you say, I've just, I've been kind of under it for a month or so now. We're going to be talking about that. Our study is going to be broken into two general sections. We're going to talk about the way down. We're going to talk about how did our souls become noisy. And now, if you're like me, as I'm, as I'm looking over this, I think, where does this, this idea of noise come from? I'll give that to you in just a second. But we're going to talk about the way down. How did we get where we are? And I'm not talking about as a nation, necessarily. I'm talking about as individuals, and I'm talking about believers. Okay? This, this study is, is not one for the lost because the lost don't have the tools that we're going to be talking about. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you'd say, I'm, I'm not at rest, I'm uneasy, you should be because you stand in danger of judgment. And you should take the time today, if you haven't before now, you should take the time and you should get that settled. And then we can move forward with new life and with the, with the power of the Holy Ghost within, we can move forward. So this study that we're going to look at for believers, we're going to talk about first, how did we get where we are or where we may be? And then we're going to talk about the way back. How do we find a quiet soul? How does God reverse this process? Because as we're going, I think you'll see this to be very, very applicable. This, is, this will probably today, there's going to be a few places where your toes are going to get a little bit stepped on. I know mine did. As I was looking over and preparing, I know that, that the Lord used this in my life. And so I would encourage you, if you have questions, if you have comments, please raise your hand and we will, we will stop for a moment. But we're going to start with the way down. We're going to notice the noise in our soul. Now, first off, first off, thoughts, not feelings. Okay? Why don't you say that with me, okay? And I'm going to explain it in just a moment, okay? In three, two, one. Ready? Three, two, one. Thoughts, no. not feelings. Okay. Here's, here's what that means, okay? Have you ever been to a pond or a calm body of water? If you've ever been with children, you know that it didn't stay calm very long because kids will find anything. And if they can't find anything, it'll be their shoe. Okay? And they're going to throw it out into the water. And as soon as you've got this beautiful, calm body of water, and you can see the sky reflected in it, until you throw a stone out, and what happens? There's, there's that spot where it hits, and what happens from that spot? Ripples out. Ripples. Circles form. How far do the circles go? Well, they go to the edge. Sometimes we can't see it necessarily, but those waves just continue out. They, they just keep going. That's, that's kind of a good illustration of, of what happens in our mind. If we want to find the source of the ripples in our life, what do we do? Well, if you want to find where did this start on a pond, you go where the circles start. 
Okay? That's, that's the point where they began. And in our minds, we want to know, why all of this disquietness? Why the noise? Well, we need to go to the center, and that's going to be a thought. That's going to be thoughts in our mind. The source of the noise in our soul is our thoughts. It's not our feelings. It's not our feelings. If we're going to trace the source of noise that would trouble our soul, we must trace thoughts, not feelings. As believers, we are to evaluate our thoughts and our thought patterns against God's word. We're going to look at this later uh, in, in greater depth. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, casting down imaginations. Where do imaginations happen? They happen in the mind. There's something that takes place between your two ears, right? You have imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God... And bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. When my thoughts are not in accordance with God's word, they should be repented of. They should be replaced with thoughts that honor God. Those thoughts are going to come from God's word. My thoughts, where's the noise in my soul coming from? Primarily, it's coming from your thoughts. It's not coming from your feelings. Why did God not tell us in this passage to bring our feelings into captivity to the obedience of Christ? Because your feelings will go away if you're thoughtless, if you're not thinking about it. Because feelings change so, so easily. Feelings change based on any number of factors, don't they? You ever wake up and you think, I don't feel well this morning, and you get going, and what happens? Well, about lunchtime, you think, I, I feel okay. Feelings can change on how you slept last night. You say, oh, I only slept for an hour and a half last night. Well, you're probably going to feel bad today. Okay. You know, I, I hadn't eaten anything in 48 hours. Guess what that's going to do to your feelings? They're, they're going to be a mess. God doesn't tell us to bring our feelings into captivity because feelings, you, you can't grab a hold of them. Thoughts, a little bit different. Thoughts are more concrete. If you remember from our study of living the exchange, do you remember these guys? We have Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. Why is this, this order important? Well, because if we keep our faith, the eyes of faith, on the facts then feelings will eventually follow, right? What happens if I, if I ignore the facts and I turn and I try to walk while I'm looking at my feelings? We're going to have problems. Why? Well, because feelings change. They change fast and they change often. Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling are, are kind of a, a side note of what we're looking at now. We are to trace our thoughts our faith, we are, to, we are to go to our thoughts, not to our feelings. Okay? It's amazing how little the Bible tells us to depend on our feelings. As a matter of fact, having read through the whole thing a few times, I can't find anywhere that the Bible tells us to depend on our feelings. The Bible does say of our heart, the seed of our emotion, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and Desperately wicked, who can know it? Okay, that's uh, that's what we should see when we see the T-shirts and the bumper stickers that say "Follow Your Heart." Somebody should pencil in that uh, that Bible reference right there. That the, the heart is deceitful above all things. If you follow your, if you allow your faith to focus on your feelings, you'll be in a world of trouble. If you allow your thoughts to to only dwell in the realm of feelings, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you keep your faith focused on the facts of God's word, feelings will often follow eventually. It takes time. It takes time, but it does happen. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to examine our thoughts and our thought processes, and we're going to compare them with Scripture. First, let's look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. You know these verses. If you'd like, you can turn to them. If you don't have these underlined in your Bible, these would be good ones to, to do. We're going to call this the prototype of peace. What's a prototype? 
experimental. The, the experimental version, the first one that rolls off. You say, well, this is the proto, the first type, the first one. This is, this is our, our, our example. Copy this and good things will happen. Matthew 11, verse 28, this is Jesus speaking. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek. And lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Think with me for just a moment. Think about your Christian life. Think about your Christian walk, your walk with God. Think of it over the past week. Think of it as you look towards the week to come. Would you describe walking with God as easy? Would you describe your walk with God as light? It, that, that doesn't necessarily line up with our experience, does it? So when my experience diverges from God's word, which one do I grab hold of? I grab hold of God's word. Why? Because if I'm grabbing hold of my experience, what, what's another word that we could call my experience? We could say my feelings. It's not going to lead us to a good place. In these few verses here, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus explains how we can have peace with God and the peace of God. Peace with God and the peace of God. The prepositions there are very important. Peace with God is ours by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ upon the cross. You, this morning, I trust you have peace with God, that you are not at odds. The Bible says in Romans that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I trust that now you're not just a sinner who Christ died for, but that you are a sinner saved by the grace of God. That's what we're looking for. That's peace with God, and we should have that, each and every one of us. The peace of God is attained by taking the Lord's invitation in these verses. Taking his invitation seriously and coming to him with our burdens to find rest. We sing sometimes the song, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them leave there. It there. That's the peace of God. I have peace with God. I've had peace with God since I was four years old when I accepted him in the, in the sandbox down in North Carolina. I've had peace with God. But the peace of God, I have had at times in my life. And just to be just to be blatantly honest with you, sometimes I've struggled with it. Sometimes I've had times where I, I really wasn't at peace. Because I took all of my problems, I took all of my troubles, all of my temptations, and I held on to them. And I'm not supposed to. I'm not big enough to hold on to those things. God would have me to, according to Matthew 28, to, to take them to him and to give them to him. The word labor, the word labor means to grow weary, to be beaten out. This word can also mean to take a beating. You ever feel like that? You get to the end of the day and you say, whew, <laughs> this day ran me hard and put me up wet, right? And it, equine illustration. I feel like I got run over by a truck mentally today. I'm, I'm doing okay physically. I just, I'm struggling right now. This labor. We feel this way sometimes at the end of the day. We get to the end, we think, too many more days like this and I'm not going to be able to get out of bed in the morning. The word heavy laden has the idea of a ship being burdened down with cargo. I think of those, those great big container ships. You see those, and they have, you know, 5,000 semi-trailers uh, stacked on them, and they're pushed down into the water. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you got the weight of the world on your shoulders? You just, just you, you've got, there's, there's family issues, there's what's going on in the world, there's, there's just personal trouble, and it, it's all there. But if you've ever felt like this, if you've ever felt like you're in the midst of labor and you feel heavy laden, Jesus is looking for you to come to him. 
A, word, a, a verse that should come as a tremendous encouragement. Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. Listen to David. He was feeling under the labor. He was feeling heavy laden. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. That first word that's in red there, he inclined unto me. It is God's inclination to come to, to, to hear and to help people who come to him with troubled and noisy souls. It's his inclination to do so. That's, that's his bent. God's bent is to help us when we come to him with a burdened and a noisy soul. I've heard, even God doesn't want to get mixed up in my problems. I'm so messed up. No, no, God does want to. God is willing. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. God delights to show himself strong on behalf of those who will come to him and acknowledge their need of him. Not for salvation. You, you've already done that. Do you need Jesus now? Yes. <laughs> like you need air. You need Jesus. You aren't made to live this life in your own power. The next phrase that you see there in Psalm 40, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit. The word horrible in, in the Hebrew means noise. He brought me up out of a noisy pit. Again, we're talking about the noise that's in our soul. He brought me up out of a horrible noise, pomp, rushing, tumult. That, that unrest that we feel within our, our innermost being, God can deliver from that. And if you come this morning and you'd acknowledge that you have a noisy soul, God's desire, according to verse 2 of Psalm 40, is to set your feet upon a rock and establish your going. Psalm 40, verse 3, he goes on. He says, And he, God, he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. This morning, God wants to take us in all of our exhausted, overloaded state and give us stability. He wants to give us joy. He wants to put a new song in our mouth. It'll be a blessing to us. And according to this verse, it'll be a blessing to others. Why? Because others will see us and they'll know, hey, that's not so-and-so. That's, that's got to be God. That's got to be God doing what's going on in their life. This is, this is for us. This is for others. If we have a noisy soul, we come to him. And we, we leave our burdens with the Lord. If we're, if we're under labor, if we're heavy laden, this is for us. Let's take an inventory, shall we? This is going to get uncomfortable, I assure you. It was for me, so your turn, okay? Just as we can trace back where the stone hit the surface of the pond by going to the, the middle circle, you say, well, it happened right here. We can trace back the noise in our soul to unbiblical or ungodly thinking. And so I'm just going to give you some, some words. We're going to talk about them briefly. Now, there are verses for all of these, every single thing. And we're going to look at those eventually, but we're not looking for right now for the way out. We're looking for how did we get where we are. So... Hold with me if you say, boy, there's not a lot of hope. Oh, there's hope. There's so much hope, and we'll get to it, but we're going we're gonna to trace our thought process. We're going to find out the source of the noise. Number one, let's talk about anxiety, fear, and worry. How many of you would say, I'm a worrier? Okay, I, I've got my hand up. I, I tend to. I don't worry about some things. My wife would say, you don't worry about what you should worry about. You worry about weird stuff. I worry about running out of ice cream. Okay? I worry about the, the important things. Uh, no, I don't really. I have plenty of ice cream. But uh, there's, 
Worry is something that can get in us, isn't it? If, if you'd say, you know what, I do struggle with worry, and, and we probably, if, if you, like me, do struggle with worry, what you worry about might be entirely different from what I worry about. But we, we ask ourselves the question, what if, fill in the blank, happens? Okay? What if this happens? And, and as soon as we start thinking, well, if it happens, then this is going to happen. And if that happens, then this is going to happen. And then nobody's going to want to talk to me because, right? Yep. Okay. You've been here, right? Okay. We've all been here at one point or another. We don't like to feel vulnerable, do we? We, we hate uncertainty. We want to know, well, this is what's going to happen. I know because I've got it on my schedule. And I know that it's going to happen. And after that's done, then I'm going to be able to move on to this, which is the next thing. And when, when we have the, the fleeting thought, well, what if that doesn't go well? Oh, there goes everything. And our, our day is ruined. These thoughts, anxiety, fear, and worry are often associated with our desire to maintain an element of control over our lives. Right? That's when we get kind of irritated, when things, when things spin out of control, and we think, what am I going to do? Well, that's a source of noise, the what if, or what am I going to do, or what if this happens, source of noise, anxiety, fear, and worry. How about, I'm going to, I have all of these kind of paired in threes, they kind of go together, discouragement, yeah. despair, and hopelessness. Now, you don't usually struggle with these here at church as much, or at least it's easier to put on the mask that you don't. But if we were to go just below the surface in the lives of many believers, we'd find this in abundance. We'd find discouragement, despair, and hopelessness. The thought, well, it, it will always be this way. What's the use in my trying to change the way things are? It's been like this since. There's no use in me trying to change it now. Despair goes hand in hand with self-pity. Very, very hand in hand in glove, you could say. The thought, well, things like this always happen to me. What, what does that lead to? It leads to a dark place. It leads to a, what I've referred to it before as fatalism, where we feel like, well, it's just fated to happen. I, if it can go wrong, Murphy's Law could be rewritten with my name in there. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong in the worst possible way at the worst possible time. That's the life I lead. I have a big target on my back, and everybody knows it. I just can't see it in the mirror, but it's always coming down the pike and hitting me. This discouragement, despair, and hopelessness. There's nothing I can do to change what's going to happen anyway. Right? You've, you've heard these thoughts, perhaps, bounce around in your own head. Another source of noise, anger, frustration, and agitation. We just mentioned a moment ago how we like to be in control. And these thoughts arise when we feel that we've lost control or that we never had control of that situation to begin with. Agitation can come, and it's, 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 a, it's a, a stressor, to put it mildly. Frustration, anger, which leads very directly to bitterness, hatred, and vengeance. You say, not believers. Oh, yes, believers. Absolutely, without doubt, believers deal with these things. When we entertain thoughts of, of how we're plagued by unjustly and un, or how we're plagued by unjust uh, and unfair uh, treatment, we can come into this noise very, very quickly. <clears throat> because we're going to look and we're going to find the the source of our problems. We're going to get even. All of the issues in my life are tied to 
my mom, my dad, my whatever, my teacher, and I'm going to get even with them. And, and it might not be I'm going to go give them a beat down. It might be I'm going to show them by any number of ways, by our attitude, by the things that we said. Holding a grudge and entertaining these thoughts of getting even are signs of these issues. Again, I said that toes will be set on. Lust, greed, and covetousness. Whenever we hear the word lust, we always think immediately of illicit sexual pleasures. We think of immoral behavior. But lust goes beyond that, but it certainly does include that. The plan to find and enjoy illicit pleasures of any kind will have to be followed by a plan to cover it up. Does that lead to stress? When you say, I'm gonna, I think I can do this and get away with it. Well, now you have to have a plan to cover that up so you don't get caught. And then you have to cover up your cover-up. And before long, you don't know which ends up because you're, you're deep in your own conspiracy. It happens. This is a, certainly true of immoral or illicit sexual pleasures, but it could also just be the endless desire for the latest and greatest gadget or trinket or whatever it is. Covetousness is something, the, the Bible tells us, don't covet your neighbor's wife, but it also says don't covet his, his animals, don't covet his land, okay? This extends far beyond just the physical things. Guilt, shame, and embarrassment, another source of noise. There's a legitimate value to guilt, shame, and embarrassment, and we shouldn't lose that. Is there, is there value to shame? Yeah. Yeah, that's, you, you dressed appropriately to come this morning. Why? It's about to be a shame not to good. <laughs> it's good. There are certain things that are expected of us by society and by God's word, and we should live up to them, and if we don't, we should be ashamed. There are times, you, it shouldn't be overused, but when you tell a child, you should be ashamed of yourself. Sometimes that's very valid because what they did was shameful. You don't do that. We don't do that. It's with the desire, if we were to say you ought to be ashamed of yourself, it's with the desire that they'll avoid acting that way in the future. But, and, and while it's true that we should feel guilt, shame, and remorse after we have sinned, God doesn't intend for us to live under guilt, shame, and and embarrassment long term. It has a purpose. You say, I, I feel guilty. Well, why do you feel guilty? Well, I robbed a bank. Huh? You should feel guilty, right? What, what should you do to not feel guilty? You should make restitution. You should go turn yourself in. Well, well guilt's, guilt's not of God. No, 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 that's not true. God uses guilt. God uses shame, but he doesn't intend for us to live under it long term. That's not good. I've been, I've been living with the guilt of something that happened to me, something that I did 20 years ago. Well, stop. Take it to the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take it to the Lord. Another source of noise, possessions, positions, and responsibilities. <clears throat> To-do lists can be wonderful things. How many of you are list people? Okay, we've got a few. How many of you have ever written something that you've already done down just so you can have the unmitigated pleasure of crossing it off the list? Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, I, I know people like you. I'm related to some of them. Okay? That's, that's just the way that it is, right? Some people list. To-do lists are good. There's nothing wrong with a to-do list. But could a to-do list become a burden that's going to pull me away from God? Oh, yes. Unless he's on my to-do list, which wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea. It's possible to even allow God-given positions and responsibilities to crowd out the most important thing. Right? So I'm, 
God has called me to be whatever it is, whatever your vocation is, whatever your vocation was. God has called me now. I do this. Well, make sure that you're involved in him. Make sure that he's the integral, the, the center portion of your life. Mm -hmm. Obsessions, addictions, and habits. <clears throat> A source of noise. This could be controlling substance, any number of them. Harmful behaviors, unclean viewing habits, and the list could go on and on and on of habits and of, of obsessions and addictions that we can have. They cause noise. You have that thing that we would refer to it when we want to sound biblical, we'd say, well, it's the sin that so easily besets me. That's not an excuse. That's not something that we should say, well, it's just a sin that so easily besets me. No, there's victory. There's victory. We've talked about it. We're going to talk about it again. Another, the last that we'll look at. Entertainment, amusement, and recreation. Is there anything wrong with these three just right off the top? Not necessarily. There's nothing wrong with, with being entertained. God made us capable of entertainment. He made us capable of recreation. I take a little bit of, of issue. The word amusement, if you think of Latin, a means not, right? Muse means think. So a amusement would be not thinking, okay? Dangerous. Okay? We are to have our minds set on him, the Bible tells us, but I know where people are going with that. Entertainment, amusement, and recreation. A quote from the book that I just want to read to you, I like the way he, he expressed it. He said, how many times have we come home from a strenuous day, and rather than spending some time reflecting upon that which God wants to do in our lives through our difficulties that day, we do something to escape the responsibility for our poor decisions of the day. It's been a bad day. I just need to sit down and veg for a while. Is that, is that going to be the most profitable thing? No. It's okay for us to be entertained from time to time, to have, have that recreation, but not at the expense of learning the lessons that God would have for us. I want you to think with me about our example. We have an example in all of this, I want you to think with me about the life of Christ. We've been going through it in the Gospel of Luke, and we've looked at it from the very beginning, and we've followed it all the way through. Jesus was constantly thronged by people, all the time. He, when he wanted to get out to be able to preach, he had to pull out from the shore, right? You remember? He got in a boat so he could back up from the people enough that they'd be able to hear it. Jesus constantly thronged by people. He was constantly being watched by those who had hated him and were looking for any opportunity to take and twist his words. So every word, every phrase that Jesus said was being scrutinized and dissected by very smart men to try to take it and twist it. Do you think that would bring with it a certain amount of stress? Oh, yes. You ever given testimony in court? You stand there and you think... Got to be careful what I say because I, I swore to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And there are people who are trying to find inconsistencies. That's what Jesus lived with. People trying to find inconsistencies. Those closest to him, his disciples, they often just totally missed what he was saying to them. It just went right over their heads. And they were constantly bickering amongst themselves. Usually about who was going to be the greatest. Can you imagine the stress and in all of this, Jesus knew what the ultimate end of his ministry was. We just celebrated it. Jesus' ministry would, in a sense, culminate at the cross. Now, we know that he, he rose again, thankfully. We, we praise the Lord for that. But Jesus knows he has, ahead of his very hard life, a very hideous death. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus didn't have a noisy soul. John chapter 14, verse 27. This is Jesus speaking. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. When Jesus said, my peace, he's referring to the kind of peace that the disciples had seen in him. 
Can you imagine? In the midst of a crowd of people giving, giving lessons that people are dissecting and the, the disciples are bickering behind him and Jesus is at absolute peace yeah. in the midst of all of them. Yeah. My peace I give unto you. <clears throat> when Jesus said, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, he was saying that his peace couldn't be gotten in the same way that the world tries to get peace. Are you trying to get peace the way the world gets peace? The world tries to get peace by filling life with distractions, possessions, adventures, and people. They try all sorts of things as an anesthesia to dull the pain of their emptiness. That's what the world does. They're constantly trying to be just a little bit more busy so that I can... There's, have you ever heard the phrase, there's calm in the chaos? Mm -hmm. The world tries to get calm in the chaos because there's so much going on, I can't focus on what's troubling me. All of this self-imposed agitation, all this noise, is a sign of spiritual dysfunction and sinful responses. God-centered souls are not noisy. God-centered souls are at rest. Jesus had peace. And it wasn't, it wasn't him so busy that he couldn't focus. It was absolute peace in his innermost being in the midst of everything that was going on. Noisy souls are dangerous. A noisy soul is destructive to the body. Rest is important. <laughs> I, I talked to people who would challenge me on that. They're wrong because we have an awful long time of human history. If you don't sleep, what happens? Weird things start happening. I had a teacher who was, he was in, uh, in some advanced training in the military. He said, you go 48 hours without sleep and you start to see things that genuinely aren't there. And it's true. When we, when we deprive ourselves of rest, our feelings are going to go haywire. If we're constantly trying to mask the noise in our souls by more and louder noises of our own choosing, we may keep the adrenaline high enough that we don't hear the noise, but that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable to keep amping up your well, I, I'm bothered, I just need more to do. There's, there's a limit to that. It can't go on indefinitely. Sometimes it's necessary to push our limits in order to accomplish a particular goal. But constant pushing is dangerous as a way of life. Perhaps you'd think back to times in your life where you abused this rule a little bit and you discovered the hard way. Pushing can be, can be helpful, but it's not sustainable. A noisy soul drowns out the voice of God. You remember in 1 Kings 19, God taught Elisha a lesson about hearing his voice. God told Elijah to go out and stand on the side of a mountain, on a little mountain pass, and, and he was to wait. And a few minutes later, a strong wind came, and the wind was strong enough, the Bible tells us, that it rent rocks. It was tearing rocks in half. That's a pretty strong wind. But the, the voice of the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. Do you remember this? Yeah. And after the fire, a still, small voice. That's still how he speaks. Yeah. But we live in a noisy society. We live noisy lives, and it's very distinctly possible that we have noisy souls. Sometimes we're guilty of trying to stir up the wind, the earthquakes, and the fires to drown out the noise of our souls. But in reality, we're drowning out the voice of God that would speak to us if we'd listen. Now, this is going to be a profitable journey for all of us as we go through this study. I, I'm convinced that the Lord would have us to go over this. If you this morning, if you're sitting here and you're honestly able to say, you know, you, you'd say, you know what? I'm not perfect, but I don't see this as a problem in my life, at least not right now. If that's you, then this will be a valuable tool for you to help others. But if you, like me, Notice your tendency. 
the tendency that we have to allow noise to gradually take over. This would be an encouragement to you. You didn't get to the noise level in your soul overnight. But God has a solution. The world is full of tumult and noise. But again, Christ, there's calm. There's peace. Absolute, undying peace. And it's available for you and I. And that's what we're going to be going over as we look at the truth that God is more than enough. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the truths of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this study as we, we go over the truths that we, that we find in your word relating to, to not just the noise that we have in our souls, but Lord, the source of peace. And Lord, we know that source of peace is you. I pray that you'd help each and every one here, Lord, and, and I don't know the particular struggles in every case. But Lord, I pray that we would come unto you, that we would, would give our burdens to you, that we would, would find that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Amen. Lord, it's only that way because of your power, not ours. I pray that we would be, be aware of this. I pray that you'd make this a blessing. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us now as we prepare our hearts for the main service. I pray that you would speak to us through your word, through the songs, through every aspect of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.